Good evening, I'm Neil Kirksal. Ian is away. Tonight, the first batch of vaccines bound for Canada are en route. This is V-4, four days to vaccination day, which is Tuesday. Officials across the country are preparing for the deliveries, planning for all possibilities. There are things that keep me up at night. As the country's top doctors deliver a dark warning for the weeks ahead. We are forecast to have 12,000 daily cases by the beginning of January. Also tonight... There's a giant hole with uh, there's just guys laying at the bottom screaming for help. Dramatic scenes in Ontario after a building collapses. Two construction workers are dead. We'll bring you the latest. The federal government lays out its plan to slash greenhouse gas emissions. It includes tripling the carbon tax. We'll break down what it means for you. And the cheer is in the mail. It just means the world to them. While COVID keeps us apart, an old holiday tradition is suddenly trending again. This is The National. With vaccinations due to start next week, hope is building across this country that this pandemic could soon end. But Ottawa is sending a sobering reality check. New modeling says nearly 1,700 more people could die from COVID-19 by Christmas if infections stay on their current path. 755 people have died just in the last seven days, including Beth Sotherby. She spent some of her final moments listening to Willie Nelson with her daughter by her side. Wen James, the 27-year-old whose story we brought you yesterday. He is being remembered for his love of family and basketball. Shah Sultan and Hassan Ali Ramtula were married for 66 years. They died an hour apart, separated in different hospitals. All terrible losses, and this country will see so many more. While the vaccines are coming, that new modeling today shows us right now, it appears the second wave is only going to get worse. Here's David Cochran. The first 30,000 doses are on their way from Belgium. So in Ottawa, to support the administration of the initial doses of Pfizer vaccine. The team at the National Operations Centre finalizing locations for equipment and freezers for when deliveries ramp up, which can't come soon enough. We are forecast to have 12,000 daily cases by the beginning of January, with increasing hospitalizations and death. With hope on the horizon, a grim reminder of today, that outside of the Atlantic provinces, COVID is largely out of control. About 100,000 new cases have been reported across the country in just the last three weeks. Critical care beds near capacity, health systems under strain. Cases rising where people are most vulnerable, including, once again, long-term care. The more of us that are infected, the more likelihood someone that works in a home will come into contact with COVID-19. It's also reached remote First Nations and Indigenous communities. This will be a difficult month for many. Series of months, in fact. A surging second wave, a national death toll that is rising sharply. Restrictions, closures and control measures are required. We must reduce our in-person contacts right now. A vaccine in a week or in a month won't help you if you get COVID-19 today. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but it's still a long, dark tunnel. Right now, Canada is averaging more than 100 COVID-related deaths every single day. The country on track to reach a total of nearly 15,000 deaths by Christmas. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, we will have much more on that light David mentioned, the vaccine that it's, that's on its way to Canada. That is coming up for you in just a few minutes. But we did want to get you up to speed on the situation across this country, starting in Ontario, where more regions will be locking down come Monday. Today, that province set a record, reporting 45 more deaths. That is a single day high during this second wave. It also added more than 1,800 new cases. Ellen Morrow takes us through the new restrictions and the new worries that come with them. 
Stephanie Deletto's holiday hope today was dashed. Ontario's York region will soon be locked down. Customers not allowed inside her family business just before the holidays. We've been through so much this year that you were hoping that this time of the year you'd be able to make back those sales that you kind of lost out at the beginning of the springtime and it's been it's going to be tough. Starting Monday, millions in York Region and Windsor-Essex will join Toronto and Peel Region in lockdown. Tougher measures coming as Ontario's COVID curve careens ever upwards. The situation is still very, very serious. We're still battling the second wave. A battle being waged in hospitals across the province. Healthcare workers, bed capacity, all under increasing strain as cases climb. Community spread of COVID-19 is starting to really wreak havoc on the ability of hospitals to function uh, and uh, do what they need to do. And even with the new lockdowns, the province isn't acting quickly enough, says Anthony Dale. Frankly, we're sailing into a hurricane and uh, this winter is going to be brutal. Fearing a spike in cases after the holidays, healthcare workers are imploring Ontarians to stick to their households. We have to remember to be vigilant. We do have a light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to go through the tunnel. Ashley Edstrom Comrie knows that tunnel all too well. It felt like I was drowning most days and it like and on like so and trying to breathe on their water. Edstrom Comrie was hospitalized for more than 60 days in the spring, some of them on a ventilator and has symptoms even now. Seeing case count surge now is hard to watch, says the 38 year old. Even if you're not personally going to get that sick and you feel like you're strong, you don't know how it's going to affect someone else, right? And I, I can't imagine doing anything that would put other people at risk. Well, Ellen, beyond the areas that are heading into lockdown soon, others are facing deeper restrictions. That's right, Neil. Three public health regions that include the cities of London, Barrie and Guelph, Ontario, will be in the red zone as of Monday. That's one step away from a lockdown. And the health care experts I spoke to today said the province is in a difficult spot. There are currently 235 people in intensive care in Ontario. Experts previously warned that 150 people would be an alarmingly high number. And the president of the Ontario Hospital Association, who we heard from in the story said he's never been more concerned. Ellen Morrow in Toronto. Thanks so much, Ellen. You're welcome. Alberta is targeting people who might be making holiday plans with a new ad campaign. It's a cheeky spot for a serious ask as officials plead with people to not increase their contacts. Infections are rising in that province. More than 1,700 cases were reported today and more restrictions on businesses are set to take effect across the province on Sunday. British Columbia reported 11 more COVID-19 deaths today, just a day after the disease claimed a record 28 lives there. The province saw 737 new cases today, 119 of them were on BC's south coast, but the bigger surge continues to come in the province's Fraser Valley, while infections balloon in the interior and the north. One of the province's hardest hit communities is now Fort St. James. With just 1,500 residents, it has seen at least 40 confirmed cases. A rapid response team is in place, but Fort St. James is not alone. As Briar Stewart shows us, northern BC's growing caseload is putting an alarming strain on the region's limited resources. Look at where I am. Harry Good documented as much of his COVID-19 ordeal as possible. At one point, he was on a ventilator, but as soon as he was conscious, he started speaking out. Don't take it for granted. And warning others. I just didn't really take it too seriously because we didn't really have too much cases up here, so it didn't really feel like it was going to happen to us until it happened to me. In the first wave of the pandemic, BC's Northern Health Region recorded very few cases of COVID-19, but that changed in mid-November. Since then, cases have been climbing steadily. The health region is huge, the population is small, just 6% of the province's total. But patients here are being hospitalized at a higher rate and the system is strained. The ICU itself is running at almost double its normal capacity. The actual system itself, I think, is it's reaching a breaking point if we don't slow down. A few patients were even sent to hospitals on Vancouver Island. 
It all left Daroliski uncomfortable, encouraging people to come to his brewery. He's also a doctor and believes people should stay home, so he shut down in-person service. I'm a physician first and a business owner second. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision. I have 50 staff. That was a really difficult decision to make. He would like to see the province force more businesses to scale back. So do others. Some also question why large industrial sites are still operating. In Kitimat, more than 55 cases have been confirmed at the LNG Canada site. There could be a big Christmas present for the North from Dr. Henry and Mr. Dix and company. To cut them back uh, to the bare bones maintenance, I think would make it sense. Anything to help prevent COVID from spreading even further in the North and having more patients end up in already strained hospitals. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. All of the stories of fear, hardship and heartbreak make images like these all the more powerful. In those boxes and en route right now are Canada's very first doses of that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Pfizer has hired UPS to deliver it, but the packages have some stops along the way. They started leaving the factory in Belgium today. Next, they will go to Cologne, Germany, then on to Kentucky. From there, the vaccine is going to be sent to 14 distribution centres in this country, two each in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and one in each of the other provinces. The whole trip takes at least 36 hours. So the vaccines should arrive this weekend. Major General Denis Fortin is in charge of all of the details, the logistics of such a critical operation, and making sure the precious cargo gets to Canadians who need it. I sat down with him earlier today. Some people have asked, why is this a job for soldiers? We bring logistics expertise of the military, we're, we're um, yeah, I think, uh, managing crises is second nature to us, and we adapt, uh, you know, quite rapidly to a number of things. So it's not a military operation. I want to make that uh, clear up front. Uh, this is very much us bolstering the capacity, and the team here is composed of uh, Canadian Armed Forces members as well as uh, public health uh, employees. This is such precious cargo, sir, you know well. How are you making sure that every step of the way these vaccines are safe and getting to where they need to be? Well, security considerations are very much key in the planning uh, of the entire activity. Uh, provinces have also indicated uh, some areas that need we need to pay attention to. And law enforcement agencies and different agencies here, uh, federal as well as provincial organizations, are paying attention to all those things that were exposed in our conversations, in our discussions. Um, and we're ensuring that we have visibility on the right things. You know, law enforcement uh, organizations will, um, you know, as they do all the time, monitor certain types of threats and they will talk to their counterparts at the provincial territorial level uh, to ensure that the, that the things are protected. There has to be something that is keeping you up at night and worrying you as you monitor this process unfolding. Well, there are things that keep me up at night. Um, I don't have a, a um, I don't have certainty about the schedule of delivery just yet. Nobody does, and uh, Pfizer is working very hard on that, as well as uh, other companies, as they are, um, you know, pending a regulatory authorization from Health Canada, uh, are lining up to uh, to deliver or to to make their product available. Uh, what, what, at what pace are we going to go? Every province and territory is also wondering how, how, how many sites should I turn on? How much? What is the, vol the expected volume? And uh, I would say to Canadians, rest assured that we're paying a lot of attention to delivering this fast, as safely as possible, and bring this to all Canadians who want to be who want to get the vaccine. Major General, good luck this weekend. Thank you very much. You have a good day. Well, an important story for you. If you have downloaded the federal government's COVID alert app, Ottawa touted it as an early warning system, a way for users to know when they've been close to someone who's tested positive. It has not always worked. Thomas Egg tells us about the glitches and the workaround. In people's pockets across most of the country, there's a tool that's supposed to be key in keeping Canadians COVID safe. I thought I definitely have a notification here or there, right? But nothing so far. 
The COVID Alert app is designed to tell users if they've come in close contact with someone who later tested positive. That was the pitch. Now, here's the catch. Like any other app, there's improvements, there's things that you discover and, and you tweak as you go. A bug has meant on some smartphones, the app hasn't worked for weeks. I saw that, in fact, there was a more than two-month gap in my app. In Ontario alone, almost 4,900 COVID cases have been reported to the app. But we don't know how many people weren't getting notifications. So even those who should have been told to isolate or seek a test didn't get the alert. If you go out, it's something that can help, but it's, it's, a, it's an app. It's, uh, it's not designed to be as reliable as a medical device with years of testing. At first, officials said the bug had been fixed. Now they acknowledge it still affects some iPhones. Health Canada says the solution is simple. Open COVID alert regularly to make sure it works. But that's a shift in the way the app was first sold in the summer. You don't have to do anything around this application other than download it. More than five and a half million Canadians have done the downloading, but how many will remember to now do that other step? Well, I haven't opened my app, but I probably should um, <laughs> now that you mentioned that. Even though I check it regularly, it still tells me I've not come across anybody with COVID. So no, it's not working to me. The app still might help, but faith in it could be fading. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, St. John. Well, breaking late tonight, the United States is now the latest country to approve the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. U.S. President Donald Trump says the first shot is going to be administered in the next 24 hours. It can't come fast enough. This was the worst week on record south of the border. More than 3,000 deaths each day for the past few days. An average of more than 200,000 new cases a day and more than 100,000 people in hospital. As Katie Simpson tells us, healthcare workers are beyond exhausted. Hospitals in hotspots are having trouble keeping up. COVID-19 is spreading faster and killing more people across the U.S. than ever before. It's a predictable result following a surge in Thanksgiving holiday travel, say the experts who had begged people to stay home. It's very frustrating for us because we're trying to save people and, and take care of you and people aren't listening to us. With the situation growing worse, there was fresh political pressure in the race to approve a vaccine. The president called the Food and Drug Administration a big old slow turtle on Twitter, demanding the agency get the damn vaccines out now. People are being asked to be patient and physically distant as they wait. We need to keep doing the things that we're doing, social distancing, wearing masks in public, washing your hands. And the lower we can get COVID rates in our community when this vaccine comes out, the quicker the vaccine is going to have its benefit. Americans also have to wait longer for financial relief. Senators gave themselves another week to reach an agreement on a new stimulus package. America is really suffering right now, and it's really broken. Robin Fader is a photographer documenting the pandemic, and what's moved her the most is what she's seen at food banks. I uh, went to one particular food line where the people line up at 9 a.m. They start to distribute the food at 1 p.m., and they're out of all the boxes, the food that they could possibly distribute by 2.30, and yet you can still see a huge line of people still waiting who have to be turned away. These challenges are expected to get worse as the pandemic drags on with no immediate end in sight. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Canada's border with the United States will remain closed into the new year. Officials have extended restrictions for another 30 days. The land border has been closed since March. Only essential travelers are allowed through. That white woman in that BMW right there sped through people, human beings. An act of violence at a Black Lives Matter protest in New York tonight. A car plowed into a crowd of about 50 people, injuring several. Some were taken to hospital. The driver was detained for questioning. There has been a deadly workplace incident in London, Ontario. It happened this morning at a construction site, a new condo building. Katie Nicholson is there tonight with the latest details. 
Frantic moments as workers dig through rubble to pull the survivors to safety. I heard a loud bang uh, above my head and then next thing I knew the steel hit me. I got thrown off my ladder and stuff. As I got out and looked beside me and there was a giant hole with uh, there was just guys laying at the bottom screaming for help. It all happened right behind Biden Hall's house. Then I looked out the window and saw, you know, men running around screaming and um, pretty sure I heard one of them yell that someone was trapped. One man escaped with minor injuries. Emergency crews pulled the rest from the wreckage, their injuries briefly pushing the hospital into a code orange, meaning a drastic community event. Middlesex London Paramedics Service paramedics have transported five people to hospital. One of those five was vital signs absent and has since been uh, pronounced deceased. A construction collapse can be complicated and looking for survivors, delicate work. As darkness fell, neighbors came by curious and to pay respects. This is really close to home. We would see the trucks parked on the road and it was all oh, there's construction, they gotta park somewhere. And I thought to myself today, Will there be some trucks still parked there that those are the ones who actually didn't make it home? And wow, uh, how close to home is that? And tonight, news that the search for one of the last workers trapped here has turned into a recovery effort. So in total, this collapse killed two workers and two to hospital in critical condition. Two others are in fair condition. And now provincial investigators are on the scene to try to find out how this all happened. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. RCMP in Nova Scotia say they have arrested 21 people in connection with that dispute back in October over lobster fishing rights. I can't stress enough that, uh, that we, we said initially when this here event occurred that we would investigate it fully and uh, that's exactly what we were doing. A pound where Mi'kmaq fishermen were storing their catch was ransacked, vandalized and lobsters thrown back into the ocean. RCMP say they are still looking for more people, as seen in these photos, and say they expect to make more arrests. The federal government announces its plan to slash greenhouse gases, in part by hiking the carbon tax. I just can't understand, for the life of me, why anyone would want to put a burden on the backs of the hardworking people. Still ahead, the plan, the reaction, and how much it will cost. But first, home for the holidays. Trying to figure out uh, a solid quarantine plan on the other end to make sure that I have a house or an apartment uh, that I can use for 14 days. Mixed messages for students on this winter break. And later, shining some light during a dark year. The message of Hanukkah is that it was a dark moment, but a little bit of light came and pushed away a lot of darkness. We're back for you in just two minutes. We're really, really grateful for how like understanding you've been this year, just of all our props, just so understanding of the situation we're in and so kind and so like thoughtful. And I think the rest of the class also has something to say. Aww. Aww. Oh, emotional university professors are popping up all over social media as students find new ways to say thank you. Well, you guys freaking rock. <laughs> well, that's like the nicest thing I've ever seen. It's a small virtual surprise to end a unique semester. It is normally time for students to head home from school, but this year, concern and confusion are putting a damper on holiday plans. Deanna Sumanak johnson spoke to students searching for answers. Student leader Brinda Chastelain says there's something many students are wishing for this holiday season, a consistent message on whether they can go home or not. We haven't necessarily seen a lot of clear policy from provincial governments about uh, what's expected of students at this time. The public health messaging from provincial authorities has generally been stick to your household, meaning don't go home. But Ontario's website suggests traveling home is possible for students if students self-quarantine or drastically reduce close contact with others for 10 to 14 days before returning home. In some other provinces, 
The advice is that it's okay for students to go home for the holidays, no mention of quarantining. Well, I think maybe students would appreciate some more guidance. At the end of the day, they do just have to follow public health orders and factor in their own decisions into this and own circumstances. We must really have a, a, a realistic harm reduction approach with the students. Uh, this medical officer of health for the region that includes Queen's University says messaging must also include advice on what to do when students return to school in the new year. That individuals uh, monitor their symptoms very closely, that they uh, avoid social gatherings in residence the very first week or two. Meanwhile, Brenda Chastelain still hopes he'll be able to visit his family in Ontario, though Nova Scotia will make him self-isolate when he gets back to school. The main thing holding me back from going into Ontario is trying to figure out uh, a solid quarantine plan on the other end to make sure that I have a house or an apartment uh, that I can use for 14 days to be able to stay away from others. Which would make for an expensive and complicated holiday in a year full of complications. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, when we come back, how Ottawa is planning to tackle the other global crisis. We'll break down what the government's climate strategy could mean for you. Plus. Do you feel like we're flying blind a little bit right now? What oceanographers are missing because of the pandemic. Welcome back. New research is highlighting the far-reaching effects of COVID-19, in particular on climate change. An international group of scientists says global greenhouse gas emissions are down 7% this year. That is the greatest annual percentage drop since the Second World War. We can thank stay-at-home orders for that, but also reduced economic activity. There have been annual dips in emissions before, but levels are expected to surge again. So any plan to reduce emissions will depend on policy, not a pandemic. Today, the federal government set out its new action plan, including, as Salima Shivji explains, how Canadians are going to pay for it. It's been five long years since Paris. And more than a year since this pledge from the Liberal government to not only meet Canada's targets to reduce carbon emissions. It's an ambitious target, but it's doable. But to exceed them. <laughs> now the Liberal government says it knows how it will get there. A far-reaching proposal, $15 billion in investment for green transit, more electric vehicles, incentives to retrofit homes. But mainly a much heftier carbon price, more than tripling it to hit $170 a ton in 10 years' time. A contentious move politically after the bitter battle some Conservative premiers have been waging against the tax and a Supreme Court challenge pending. I just can't understand uh, for the life of me why anyone would want to put a burden on the backs of the hardworking people. It's also really disrespectful of the Supreme Court simply saying we're confident so we're going ahead. The Prime Minister framing the hike as necessary. We will put even more money in the pockets of Canadians by increasing the price on pollution. And putting an emphasis on the rebates to offset the higher price at the pumps. Those checks will soon be much more noticeable. Those rebates will be received quarterly rather than once per year. A shrewd move, according to many political watchers and environmental policy experts. It's the lowest cost policy uh, that we have in the toolkit. It's going to be the one that's going to be best for our economy, and it's going to return money to households. The Liberals have calculated and say this plan will exceed Canada's Paris targets by as little as 1% on its own and as much as 10 if the provinces are willing to play ball and commit to more stringent measures to tackle climate change. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. If you want a case study in the link between pa the pandemic and the climate, the world's ocean researchers have a story for you. Lean forward and let Tom Murphy guide you through it. Consider this. The ocean is teeming with clues that allow scientists to interpret everything from your long-range weather forecast to the latest climate change affecting the Earth. The problem is, with COVID restrictions, oceanographers like Brad DeYoung haven't been able to get out there to study the ocean's latest hints of where this globe is headed. It's really critical because 
we can't understand it by just staring at the ocean from the shoreline. We actually have to be at, in the ocean, at sea, making these measurements. Do you feel like we're flying blind a little bit right now? I feel like we're, we're, our glasses are very dirty and we're, they're, they're getting dirtier as we speak. Normally, there's a vast network of scientists on the water all over the world, monitoring our oceans with high-tech gadgets like this autonomous wave glider. It can track the endangered North Atlantic right whale, for example, find its food, inform big ships to steer clear to protect the near-extinct species. This is one of our wave gliders. But Anya Waite of the Ocean Frontier cars, Institute in Halifax says the pandemic the means fewer here. gliders, research trips canceled. It's much harder to get ocean observations than it was before COVID. And the ships are holding fewer people. You have to be socially distanced. They're crewed um, fewer days of the year. Now, if you figure all that measuring of waves, wind and atmosphere doesn't affect you, think of your long range forecast. Every time, you look at what temperature is going to be tomorrow and you see that nice hourly thing you can get, that app, that's ocean data. Right? And for so some companies, it is especially have, critical. Uh, the petroleum industry and oil industry, they depend on good weather forecasting um, and they also use a lot of ocean data to understand how their infrastructure is going to be interacting with the ocean over the, you know, the course, the lifetime of that infrastructure. All those industries and government agencies, lobster fishers, Lots of people use ocean data and they don't know they're using it. All that technology out there emitting data, measuring waves and winds, how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, many of it is run by batteries that have either died or are about to. Thousands of devices beaming back millions of bits of ocean data informing the so-called blue economy, from companies insuring shipping lines to fishermen relying on weather forecasts. They're all a little more in the dark these days. Emma Heslop is with the Global Ocean Observing System out of France. So we see far fewer scientists being able to, to, to go on board, less science being done. So imagine things like uh, El Nino, La Nina. This is a coupled ocean atmosphere phenomena, and it's vital to have ocean measurements for that in order to, to have any kind of prediction for wildfires in Australia and you know, what the impact will be sort of in, in the US and, and up into, into Canada on the, um, on the west coast there. Case in point, this device, the Argo. It drops to the depths of the ocean, periodically coming to the surface to emit data to a satellite. But with scientists being kept on shore, unable to attend to them, their flow of data is down an estimated 10%. Even data from the marine life tagged with transmitters is down 50% because fewer of them are able to be tagged now. And some of the research will never be recovered. Remember that huge ice shelf collapse, the one in Canada's north? That's a moment scientists will never get back. What is lost when, for example, scientists, the eyes and ears of the scientists, are not there to witness and to explain something like an ice shelf collapse? In a laboratory, I can redo an experiment, but you can't do, redo the ice shelf collapse experiment. So when we miss these opportunities to see what's happening, uh, then we're you know, losing understanding or just a recognition of the impact that climate change will have on, on the environment around us. And then there's this year's hurricane season. Brad DeYoung's team was supposed to be flying a drone into those storms. With COVID, he couldn't. And of course, this year we've seen 30 now uh, named storms the most ever on record. The, the key thing that we're losing then is the information about that, the formation of these hurricanes. This German research cruise is back up and running, one of the few. Some COVID restrictions have been modified, but the work is still slowed. Emma Heslop says often you can get half the data for twice the cost. Some networks, they lost the ability to observe perhaps 90% of their data. Um, so I think that uh, it, it's kind of a, a wake up call as an observing system that we, we, we need to have uh, build greater uh, flexibility. 
She says it could be a year or more before things really get back to normal, but fears a gaping hole in our true understanding of 2020 on the ocean could ultimately lead to a less complete picture of climate change. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Up next for you, weathering the storm. I'm going to fight right to the end. I'm not going to shut it down because I'm here 23 years. What these past few months have looked like for one family-owned restaurant. Welcome back. You know it by now. COVID-19 has hit the restaurant sector as hard as any other. As many as 10% of restaurants are estimated to have gone out of business and more could follow. Tonight, Nick Purden introduces us to one owner who is determined to beat the odds. This is my life. I have loved this restaurant ever since we opened it. I'm going to fight right to the end. I'm not going to shut it down because I'm here 23 years. Olga Perusas can't imagine life without Pantheon, but the pandemic has slowed her business to a crawl. That's how it is sometimes. You just sit here and you become numb. It's hard to picture it now, but Pantheon used to be one of the busiest restaurants in Toronto. That was before COVID. Now sales have dropped 75%. I go home, I sleep, and I wake up and I come here. I just worry to see where it's going to go even further. Like, we just have to see if I can make it through the winter time. When the first wave of COVID hit, Olga shut the restaurant for a month. She didn't know what else to do. It was the youngest member of the family who came to the rescue. Olga's daughter, Cristalia, who's also worked at the restaurant for years, believed that takeout could keep Pantheon going. We can't give up on the restaurant. It's my home. It's, it's a family, you know, like front end, back of house, we've had the same staff for 23 years and I get excited coming here and I want to be here. I love spending all my time here. It's honestly my home. Cristalia knows how hard it is for her family to see the place struggle. Pantheon's in her blood too. The restaurant is 23 years old and so is Cristalia. They spent more time here than at home, so they would bring me with them and I would fall asleep on the chairs and then I would sleep underneath the bread box. I would bring all my little dolls and my toys to keep myself occupied throughout their whole shift. And I remember because they would be cutting bread on top of the bread box that I was sleeping under, they would put a tablecloth so the crumbs wouldn't fall on my face while I was sleeping. Cristalia's memories will survive and she hopes the restaurant will too. But the family already has made one tough decision because of the pandemic. In order to keep Pantheon open, they had to shut down half the restaurant and give it back to the landlord. I love this place. What's it like to look in there and see it empty? It breaks my heart. I mean, I know it's only walls, but it was... This is what I used to wake up to come to. Does it scare you that the other side could go too? Um, no because I'm going to hold on to the other side. But I've lost half of me. So I just have to learn how to live with the other half now. What's happening at Pantheon is happening in restaurants all across the country. Many won't survive COVID. Pantheon, may I help you? These days, every takeout order is a big deal. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ted works the grill. He's been here since Pantheon opened. He used to handle hundreds of orders. So it's not lost on him that the restaurant is struggling. Do you worry about your job? Of course, because hey, you know, if something's to happen here, at my age, where I'm gonna go? At my age, 62 years old, you know, you're not young no more. Yes, it scares me, it scares me. I'm gonna come in tears now. That's it. I just hope, you know, things get back to normal. Keeping Ted and the rest of the staff employed is one of the main reasons the family says they're fighting to stay open. It's a huge weight, to be honest, a huge weight on our shoulders. We have to be positive for our staff because, you know, we can't let them know that no, ready. we've given up. Because once they know that we've given up, they give up. 
right? So we have to be able to encourage everyone to be positive and that it's going to be okay. okay perfect. Thank you, Thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye. Businesses are supposed to make money. That's why you start one. And Pantheon is a reminder that if businesses are forced to shut down, what's lost can't just be measured in dollars. We're going to fight through everything during COVID and even if it takes our last dime, we're going to work through as a family and just keep the doors open. Yeah, we're going to give it our all. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Determination. After the break for you, delivering a holiday message to your loved ones. You go realize, oh, you know, I'm not going to see my family this year or our friends. We need to buy some cards. An old tradition that is making a 2020 comeback. Welcome back. With families, friends and loved ones staying apart this winter break, Canadians are turning to holiday cards to spread some much needed joy. Here's Jacqueline Hansen. Nikki Howell felt compelled to help when the pandemic hit and seniors in long term care were cut off from their families. It breaks my heart thinking of anybody feeling alone. Back in March, she came up with a plan to create and donate homemade cards to long term care residents. Howell and her daughter made the first batch, then family, friends and her community joined in. All of a sudden, word of mouth spread and, you know, it just kind of blew up on me. <laughs> Now she's making her biggest delivery yet for the holidays, 2,000 cards and hopefully 2,000 reasons to smile. When they know that somebody took the time out of their day to put the thought towards them, I think it just means the world to them. It's a message that not only seniors need now, as COVID fears keep friends and families apart for the holidays. People realize, oh, you know, I'm not going to see my family this year or our friends. We need to buy some cards. At this Toronto card store, demand is high for some humor. One that says, uh, let's ride out the shitstorm together, which is uh, our runaway bestseller this year. Independent artisan designs are also gaining traction online. Compared to this time last year, Etsy says searches on its online marketplace for holiday cards have nearly doubled. Emily Shermer is seeing that firsthand. When she was temporarily laid off in the spring, she started creating new cards for her Etsy store and transformed Trudeau's infamous speaking moistly quote into a coveted card. I started going from getting maybe one sale a month to getting 40 sales a day. A rollout of holiday gems has pushed her sales up higher than she ever expected. I'm excited to come home at the end of the day after a long day and sit there for five hours and make cards for people. Sharing in the hope of delivering more than a card. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, another way to offer light in the darkness. Spread the light. Call someone else to wish them a happy Hanukkah. How Hanukkah feels even more important for so many this year. We wanted to ensure that everyone could experience Hanukkah the way it was meant to be. Anybody that needs one, we want to make sure the spirit of Hanukkah is there with them. Well, this Jewish community is giving away what they are calling Hanukkah in a box with everything one would need to celebrate at home, including latkes, a menorah, and some dreidels. The creative ways to celebrate Hanukkah in a pandemic do not stop there. Here's our moment. This is a car menorah. We place it on top of a car, and every night we add one bulb so people know that which night of Hanukkah it is, and we spread the light of Hanukkah throughout the city. We're going to have uh, the big menorah on a truck, and people will know what time we're driving by their streets. The first night, we light one candle. The second night, you light a second one. The third night, the third candle, and so on. The holiday of Hanukkah, which is the holiday of light, we must spread light. Uh, we have an obligation to do so. If for every hand we don't shake must be a phone call that we place. We must call people, especially those that are living alone. Focus on the good things. Focus on the positive things that we have in life. The message of Hanukkah is that it was a dark moment, but a little bit of light came 
and pushed away a lot of darkness. If that's the message for every year, how much more so for this year? It's a powerful message, one we should all remember. Well, that is The National for this December 11th. Good night.